Those of us here at Colorado State University are proud to share with you this session of Endoscopy Talks. When you're looking for inspiring veterinary CE experiences, think CSU Vet CE. Nestled up against the Rocky Mountains in our new State of the Future facility, we invite you to experience what we call CE Elevated. We'd love to see you in one of our future on-site, online, or blended courses. Check us out at www.csuvetce.com. Now, please enjoy Endoscopy Talks. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Endoscopy Talks. I'm Christopher Chamnus with Carl Stortz, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us on behalf of Colorado State University's Translational Medicine Institute, also known as the TMI. Today, we have two distinguished guests. Dr. Munir Qureshi is a practicing vet from California who's been performing endoscopic diagnosis and treatment of ear disease for over 23 years. And Dr. Mahmoud Bhutta from the UK is an honorary professor of otolaryngology at Brighton and Sussex Medical School and a human ear surgeon practicing in Brighton. Munir and Mood have been working together for several years, comparing endoscopic and surgical approaches to a variety of pathological conditions and translating some of the expertise from human to veterinary. So without further delay, I'm very pleased to present Munir Qureshi and Mahmoud Bhutta. Thank you, Christopher. It is my pleasure to be here. I want to thank CSU and STORES uh, for sponsoring this. I want uh, to thank all participants to be here and special thank to Dr. Bhutta who is trying to stay awake from the UK at one o'clock in the morning. Thank you. Uh, without any delay, we have lots to cover. So we will start with our introduction. Next slide, please. So how did I start with this? It is a long journey. It is a lot of uh, effort that went in there. I started the endoscopy since 1998. And when I first started, I was looking at the ears, did not know what I was looking. I was treating the ears, did not know what I was treating. And I followed the protocol that I learned in veterinary medicine, ear cytology, ear culture, every ear has nothing but ear infection. Then if that did not work, I would go towards the uh, food allergy and atopic dermatitis. And even I had a very pathetic outcome from my treatment. So eventually I decided that I need to look more into what is going on with the ears. Uh, next, please. Um, so I decided to join the human medicine. And when I looked at it, there were over 10,000 otologists in human medicine. And I said, how come there is 10,000 otologists in human medicine and in veterinary medicine, uh, we don't have that specialty. So. Um, I started looking, started studying more and more about what the ears are. I learned, uh, I joined a number of institutions, um, including um, Howard Medical School, Stanford Medical School, uh, UT uh, Southwest, all those places. I joined a lot of uh, organizations and uh, I realized that in ears, it's not a unicellular organ. There are a number of, number of different cell types which plays the role. There is the bones, there is, uh, there is a, a nerves, there is a cartilage, there's a joint, there is um, muscles, tendon, ligaments, uh, mucus layer, ciliary layer. And if we get into more detail into cochlea or uh, cochlea has that lot more cellular structure and all those different cell types has the disease problem. So I had to learn physiology, pathophysiology, how the diseases occur in those areas, and then different institutions, I learned how to approach to this uh, uh, disease places. So I did the uh, hands-on cadaveral dissection, see different techniques, which one would work for different uh, disease conditions, and then modify into veterinary medicine. And doing that, I was in Australia where um, I was attending International Society for Otitis Media, and I happened to meet Dr. Bhutta. Uh, I showed him some slides, I showed him some images, and I asked him some questions and asked him about the difficulties I was facing. And since then, he has been wonderful. Um, 
showed me what is the real disease, ear diseases are, how to approach that. And then all these slides that you see started making sense. So without any delay, I want to thank Dr. Buta and I'm going to turn it over to Moon. Thanks very much, Manir. So yeah, it was fortunate that um, those uh, five years ago now, I think it is, um, that I met uh, Manir at that conference. And I mean, I think um, it's fair to say Manir is a bit obsessed with ears and I, I'm completely obsessed with ears as well. Um, so I'm an otologist. I specialize only in ears. Um, uh, well, I do ENT, but I specialize in ears and that's pretty much all I operate on. So obviously in human medicine, we get very specialized, but I, I also was interested in research. So my PhD actually included middle ear research and then I undertook some analysis in the mouse where we were analyzing some of the, uh, some of the uh, processes that I was looking at at the molecular level. But within the mouse, I was undertaking endoscopic diagnosis and microscope assisted surgery. So when Mania approached me and said, oh, I've got cats and dogs, I thought, well, done it in a mouse, why not, why not uh, expand to other species? And so I guess I've always had some interest in translating between species and understanding ear disease. And um, exactly as Manir was saying, it's been uh, interesting seeing that there are differences in, if I'm honest, how specialized uh, ear disease is uh, within human medicine compared to the veterinary world. What we recognize in human otology, human study of ear diseases, is the importance of visualization. You've really got to see what's looking in the ear. And, and we're fortunate because if you look back in history, in 16th century Italy, there, there were the first descriptions of trying to examine the ear and people were using sunlight. And they would say that you can only examine the ear really between um, the hours of 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. when the sun was high in the sky. In the uh, 19th century, uh, we moved to Germany where someone had invented this head mirror and where you could reflect more light and they could suddenly see a little bit more down this deep dark canal and the otoscope effectively was, was born. And then in the 1950s, that was further developed with magnifying pieces and we developed this binocular microscope which really opened the world um, of human ear surgery where people could suddenly start to see all the microscopic structures that are, make up the human ear. All human ear surgery is done either with a microscope or an endoscope. And of course, many of you here will know that the endoscope was uh, the brainchild of um, Harold Hopkins in the UK, who in the 1960s started um, experimenting with various optics and, and glass lenses and created uh, this rigid endoscope, um, which I'm ashamed to say wasn't really uh, taken up rapidly in the UK and it was really a German uh, by the name of Karl Storz, who took this and saw the potential, and of course, um, huge potential that we see now. And this is now used in human ear surgery, as well as the microscope, the endoscope, because really it's visualization that is the key to understanding what's going on in the human ear. And it's central to management as well as understanding what's going on. So for example, in human ear disease, when we have otitis externa, um, certainly if you see a specialist, you will always use a microscope and you will clean out the ear. We get the cases that in primary care um, ha have failed to uh, be treated with sufficiently with topical antibiotics. And in human disease, if you clean out the ear and you clean out all this debris, in the vast majority of cases, you get it to settle. And I've had many, many cases referred from primary care where it just needs a good clean out of all the debris at a, an appropriate early, uh, early as possible juncture. And occasionally there's foreign bodies as well that can cause this discharge in the ear, um, more in children, I guess, rather than adults. But it's also central to diagnosis. We recognize that that chronically discharging ear um, that just won't settle may actually signify other pathology, particularly pathology in the middle ear. Just because there's discharge in the outer ear doesn't mean it's come from the outer ear. It could, of course, have started from the middle ear. So it's not unusual to see in an ear that just won't settle that there is actually a perforation of the tympanic membrane, which is this image that you see here on the right. Or there may be some polyps some granulation tissue, or there may be this disorder called cholesteatoma, which is or sometimes called a tympanokeratoma, which some of you may have read about or may be aware of if you're a specialized in ear, which is where the squamous epithelium, the skin of the tympanic membrane, seems to grow by itself, perpetuate and grow inwards. What's also different about the human versus the veterinary medicine is we recognize that otitis externa can be caused by otitis media, but we don't recognize it the other way around. So we don't ever say that otitis externa 
causes otitis media. We just don't see that. And uh, I just, you may be interested to read this quote um, that says, in primary care, cholesterol should be suspected in an ear with recurrent or persistent discharge that failed to settle fully with treatment. Only a full visualization of the tympanic membrane allows a cholesterol to be excluded. That was this guy called Butter writing the British Medical Journal in 2011. So is this relevant to uh, ear disease in the dog? Um, I think it is. I think it's certainly if I look through some of the history uh, and some people here will be more au fait with this. Uh, back in 1982, Lane wrote a book on ENT and oral surgery. And he said that actually in his experience, um, a diagnosis of otitis media may be considered if there is persistent otitis and otorrhea in the dog. Um, in, that, in that time, endoscopes weren't so uh, easily available. He did describe that you could stick a scope in and have a look, but he also described this other technique, which was to take a blunt needle and try and push it down the ear and see if you can get through the, uh, through the uh, tympanic membrane, perhaps rather crude by today's standards. And that was just to find out if there is a hole just by palpating, feeling whether there's a hole there. Interestingly, in a journal uh, publication from just uh, two years ago, um, they did MRI scans on a number of dogs um, who had chronic otitis externa. So this was a study of nearly 200 dogs with chronic otitis externa. And they looked at MRI scans of these dogs and they found that uh, a, a quarter of them actually had evidence of otitis media and where they could visualize the middle ear, a lot of these dogs had perforated tympanic membrane, suggesting that some of these chronically discharging ears are not necessarily due to dermatitis, but due to middle ear pathology that's discharging out. And so we can do MRI scans, we can do CT scans of the dog, but they don't actually give you the, di the, the definitive diagnosis. And I think really this is what you need to do with the endoscope. And I'm gonna hand back to Manir now who tell you some of the equipment that you might need to enable that. So talking about the equipment, definitely that is a very important part of otology. And it's just like if you are in, into a car racing, you don't want to show up with the four pinto. And that is what is happening. And I see quite a bit that people get to use equipments, little second grade equipments, and then can start doing otology. Uh, I personally would not go to a doctor if I had a ear problem and he had some all use equipment using. So talking about the equipment, it is very important that getting quality equipment is, is, is the key. Uh, minimum is telescope that you need to have to, uh, I mean, to, telepack. Telepack is, is the most minimum uh, scope that you want to use. Um, that has a light source, that has a camera. And then on the left side, it's the autoscope which uh, makes you visualize the ear pathology. You can examine the ear and it has got a working channel. And in the middle, that is a wet pump. Wet pump is, is your hand. So if you are doing the surgery, you need to have visualization, your eyes and your hands. So the eyes is your uh, autoscope and your hands is the wet pump. And you, you perform surgery completely looking at your telepack screen. So the next one, you can improve your visualization. We, we are at the 11th uh, scope now, and each time we have in, improved or the, upgraded the scope, we started seeing pathology that, is, that was very interesting. We started seeing more and more diseases and uh, was uh, much, much, busy, much easier to identify what you're doing. Now they have a newer Rubina that is just introduced uh, in January. Uh, very, very interesting technology that is going to revolutionize the surgical part. Uh, it it's, uh, differentiates between the disease uh, tumor versus normal tumor. So it will be a very interesting addition. Uh, we also need some micro instruments and these micro instruments, again, they are your hands. They go way deep down into different uh, recesses, different area. If you are using endoscope and you are into the uh, bulla, all these equipments are very useful. Um, the different scopes, if you want to get more advanced, these are the different scopes uh, we use <clears throat> to get down to the disease that we need to get down to. CT scan. These days, CT scans are very useful. 
uh, if somebody is serious about doing the ear uh, treatments without the CT scan, it is it is almost impossible. And one of the main reasons why CT is very important in veterinary medicine is they don't talk. Uh, we don't have all the tests that uh, in human medicine they do, uh, hearing tests, uh, tympanometer, all those things are not applicable. So to identify where the disease is in detail, CT scan is very, very important. So this is the setup we have. Uh, that is a 4K monitor right there. We are using 4K camera. Uh, Mood is helping me with the surgery. There is uh, image guidance, guidance right there that identifies exactly your location, where you are uh, while doing the surgery. Okay, questions? Yes, I have a couple of questions here. The first one is, uh, do animals get tinnitus like humans? Okay, uh, do, do pets get tinnitus? Uh, I'm sure they do. I see some of the pathology that is very identical in human medicine when they have tinnitus. It is not very practical, or if right now the technology is not well established to identify or diagnose how much tinnitus dogs have. There are a number of different changes uh, in the middle ear that creates the tinnitus. And, and those, those changes do exist in dogs and cats. Okay. And the other question is also a comparison with humans. For, uh, for benign vertigo in people, they do maneuvers to move the crystals from the semicircular canals. What about animals? Um, I have not seen it. It's not identified. I have been working on my CT to identify the semicircular canals. Um, they are very small, especially in cats. They are extremely hard to identify, but to, to maneuver and, and call, you know, the fix the vertigo or any kind of neurological imbalance, it's not tried out as far as I know in veterinary medicine. Okay, and the third question is with regard to the otoscopes, you showed a number of otoscopes. Okay, the standard one is clear. What would be your second most important otoscope in terms of size or dimensions compared to the standard otoscope you, you use? Okay, so the otoscope, I showed a number of otoscope and they, they are used for a number of different things. But besides the otoscope that we have, I would go for the diagnostic scope, uh, which in, in my opinion, to diagnose the disease is very important. And that is in front of the owner also. And, and for that purpose, I use the scope, it's uh, 1518. Okay. I'm sorry, 1218 12, 12, or 1215. 12, 12, okay. So that is a number. Human otoscope, yeah, four millimeter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They, they are very handy. They get you to where you need to go to. They are four millimeter, three millimeter scopes. They give you very good uh, visualization and very easy to use. Okay. We do not have any other questions at the moment. I do want to encourage people from the audience to submit your questions uh, whenever they come across your mind on the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. Okay, that's it for now. Thank you, Krista. So I'm just going to describe now some of the normal anatomy um, that you might see in the dog and the cat, obviously the two species that I imagine most of our um, uh, listeners uh, will be uh, examining. Um, so uh, I'm sure that many of you are aware of the basic anatomy of the dog and the cat here. Um, obviously, there's a vertical portion to the external auditory canal with a horizontal portion. Um, in the dog, the middle ear cavity um, is um, relatively simple. It's a, a, a bulla, so just um, a, a simple sort of, you know, uh, um, spherical or, or ovoid shape uh, containing this very structures. Um, but the structures within are actually fairly complex, as I'll show you. Whereas in the cat, um, you have a similar thing, but there is an actual septum within that bulla, which almost completely, almost completely divides this into two sections. We don't actually know why there is a septum. In fact, we're doing some work related to that, but that's just something to be aware of anatomically. So uh, looking a bit more detail at the dog, this is, an, uh, this is you know, the sort of high quality image you can get now with modern endoscopes. 
So um, obviously straightening out the uh, ear canal so that the vertical and horizontal portions align um, and then the endoscope can be placed down. Um, uh, with a dog, it may be under anesthesia, it may not be depending upon um, the behavioral characteristics of a particular dog. Um, and here you can uh, hopefully see there is the, the malleus, that white streak uh, just coming down here is the malleus, uh, the first bone, and this is the tympanic membrane. I'll actually show you uh, a further image of that um, uh, later. So um, looking actually at the, um, the dog itself in a bit more detail, we've also got the bulla, which is on the base of the skull, um, of course, which is the um, which is that um, that sort of you know ovoid shaped middle ear space um, highlighted here on this diagram, and we can dissect into that. So on a cadaveric dissection uh, to show you some normal um, anatomy, um, this is what you see when you go inside. And um, there, are, it, you again, the view you get with the endoscope is phenomenal. You know, you can see individual capillaries, you can see capillaries overlying. Um, various structures, and you can start to recognize those structures. So certainly, um, reading through the literature, uh, surgery in the dog is sometimes associated with complications of surgery, sometimes quite serious complications, such as um, disruption of the facial nerve, which hopefully you can see is labeled here, the facial nerve running through the ear. And of course, without adequate visualization, it's uh, very, very difficult to recognize where you are. Um, you know, and, and I, you either need a microscope, but I think here an endoscope is, is much better as it allows greater visualization than even a microscope would. You can also see other structures. You can see the ossicles, so the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Uh, these are all tiny, tiny, tiny structures. You know, you're talking one millimeter long, perhaps, for the stapes. You've got the tympanic nerve. Um, you've got the round window. This area here is the promontory, which is where the cochlea, the inner ear, actually sits. And you do need to be careful there because, um, as you'll see later, if you go through that area, you'll actually end up within the cranial cavity. Um, and uh, here's a eustachian tube, pharyngotympanic tube, and the jugular vein. So in the cat, again, you've got the vertical and horizontal segments. The ear canal in the cat is, is uh, shorter, so it can be easier to instrument, although it may be uh, a fairly narrow canal, but um, the endoscopes now um, have good visualization even with the narrow bore. And here you can see the cat, the cat malleus there in the middle, which is straighter than that of the dog. And you can also see this sort of structure that almost looks like a water level. That's actually the, the, um, the septum that I mentioned to you, or part of the septum. And I'll show you now still image with the tympanic membrane removed. So you can see a bit more of the structure of what you would see inside. And again, you can see um, ossicles. So here's the malleus. We've got the incus up here in the top left and the stapes, the last bone. Again, these tiny little structures and the facial nerve running over it. In the cat, the tympanic plexus is particularly important. Um, um, an injury to, is in this area can lead to sympathetic um, yeah, damage to the sympathetic nervous system. And we've got various other structures. And here's that bulla septum going across, um, almost dividing um, the uh, bulla space into two. Um, so uh, again, we can go in through the cat buller. Um, the cat buller is actually relatively easy to find. It's easily palpable on a cat. And so entry into the cat buller, again, this is in a cadaver. We've taken off the, um, the, the buller wall. This is this first hole that you see. And we're going through with an endoscope through the buller wall. And um, you can see there's another opening. That opening has also been created through the buller septum common error is not to realize that there is a septum and you need to go through that septum if you're taking the ventral approach into the middle ear and here through that ventral approach you can see the tympanic membrane which again is shown here and the same structures that I mentioned to you before um, things like the tympanic membrane the malleus also the corda tympani um, the nerve of taste which also um, runs through there. So I'm going to hand back to Munir now to talk about some pathology. So we are going to go through some case studies here. Uh, I'll be going a little, too, a little fast uh, because there are a few we are going to cover. Uh, so infected uh, anterior inferior research is one of the most common pathology we see in the, in the dogs and cats. Uh, that is the, the anterior inferior research is created by the angulated tympanic membrane. Uh, and the, the presentation could be anything. It could be simple as discharge like this 
or there could be no discharge. So looking at the next slide, uh, this is how we clean the uh, entry into your recess. So after cleaning, initial cleaning, this is what we are doing with the saline flush. This is a warm saline. All this built up sits in the corner and accumulates. Uh, if, if any any solution or any medication is applied, it does not reach where it needs to go. So it needs to be cleaned up very well. The, this one is uh, uh, constricted isthmus. Isthmus is the, the joint between the cartilaginous ear canal and the bony ear canal. Uh, in in brachycephalic breed, it is very narrow. So quite often, you don't see uh, the tympanic membrane. And it needs to be cleaned out because the, the corner captures a lot of debris and over a period of time, it gets infected, causing cholesterol is very common in brachycephalic breed because of the infected injury into your recent. So the next slide is uh, how we apply the medication. So after cleaning, the medication has to go all the way down into the uh, recess before you get any good results. So the, the tumors or polyps, and, and that occurs in dogs and cats. Again, it could be any kind of presentation. It could be discharged like this. After cleaning the discharge, you can, you can visualize the, the tumor that is in the horizontal ear canal. Um, next slide. Okay, so uh, this dog, this is a four and a half year old Labrador retriever, female. Uh, initially, the complaint was the dog was scratching, eating the ear. And when I put the, mic, uh, the endoscope, uh, the ear canal was absolutely clean. Deep down, I saw a little uh, built up of ceremonious uh, accumulation. After cleaning, the, uh, underneath there was a basal cell neoplasm, and that you know it's, it, every every ear needs to be cleaned out before making any uh, definitive diagnosis. Okay. Uh, so initial presentation, this one looks like absolutely a pseudomonas ear. Um, and th this, this uh, cat had a problem for a couple of years. And finally, we ended up seeing the cat. There is inflammatory polyp causing all kind of discharge. Um, in, in inflammatory polyps are easy to deal with. It can be removed very easily with the loop. Um, next. So you gradually advance the loop, you, you catch the polyp, anchor it properly, and apply continuous traction. Uh, the polyp should come out with the little stem underneath that is attached in the middle ear or on the middle ear floor. Sometimes that attachment is on the jugular bulb and the ear can bleed quite a bit. Eventually the bleeding stops, but you need to be aware that there could be quite a bit of bleeding from removing the polyp. So looking at the, uh, this dog, this next slide. This one again looks like Pseudomonas and um, it's, a, it's a 11 year old terrier mixed dog, um, had the problem, the dog kept getting the ear clean flush and, and treatment, it did not resolve any issues. So finally we cleaned the ear. This looks like polyp, uh, inflammatory polyp, but it came out, it turned out to be sebaceous gland carcinoma. So you can see the difference two weeks later after removing all that, how different the ear looks like. So foreign body and grass seeds, that is another problem in some part of the world. And they are very problematic. This is an 11 year old Cocker Spaniel. It was treated uh, for nine months. The lady just adopted the dog and the dog had ear problem. The dog was uh, checked out at the hospital where they had over 30 veterinarians on staff. Uh, finally, the, the ears were not getting better. So we ended up seeing this is what we found after cleaning uh, thoroughly. And that is a grass seed just packed in the deep down in the horizontal ear canal. And after removing this grass seed, uh, the horizontal ear canal had quite a bit of reaction from the, from the presence of the grass seed um, tentacles. So the next slide is we went deep down into the middle ear 
and this is the middle of your floor. Um, you can see there is a residual grass seed still there. If you do not remove, reoccurrence is very high. So going into the middle ear with the scope, different scopes, you can get good visualization. You can remove that and can resolve the problem. Um, next, yeah. So this is another case. Um, there is a, quite a bit of built up in there. Uh, you look inside, go deep down, there is pseudomonas kind of uh, infection. Quite often we take culture and we keep treating the infection and we don't get the resolution. This is what was sitting down there. This is a grass seed. Uh, again, the grass seeds are very irritating. So there's a lot of tissue reaction uh, on the horizontal ear canal and on the tympanum also. This is after removing the grass seed. You can see how many different uh, polyps are, are taking place. This, yes, uh, next. Yeah, this is a week later. You can see quite a bit of uh, improvement. And after a year later or 15 months later, this is what the year looks like. So you need to identify, diagnose the problem properly and the scope. Without the scope, this are not possible. We keep treating ears for infection and food allergy and atopic dermatitis. But until you, you diagnose the problem, it is very hard to tell what is the true, true pathology. Cholesteatoma. Cholesteatoma or tympanokeratoma. Uh, it's, as Dr. Puta mentioned, it is the uh, growth of uh, squamous epithelial from the tympanic membrane. It can present as a dry ceremonial discharge. After you clean, uh, you get to see the bottom line. Here, the tympanic membrane has a nice perforation, and you can see the cholesteatoma pearl. Uh, removing that is very satisfying. There is a lot of discharge in there. Um, Cholesteatoma discharge has osteolytic chemicals which destroys the bony structure in the middle ear and inner ear and causes a uh, lot of symptomatic problems, neurological problems. So all the cholesteatoma material is, is coming out from the flush. Next, okay. Um, Chauncey, initial presentation, he had a neurological sign. He could not walk straight. He was leaning towards the balls to support himself. After cleaning deep down, um, this is what we have, the pars placida retraction causing cholesteatoma. And so this kind of cases needs surgery. Otherwise, the, the disease keeps uh, progressing further and further. Okay, questions? Okay, yes. Uh, in your practice, which of these pathologies is most common? Cholesteatoma, polyps, foreign bodies, or tumors? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the, the, the changes that we are seeing nowadays, what we see is we see more and more advanced cases uh, after multiple attempts of uh, treating the ears. And if I have to say, what do we see? We see everything. It is these cases that I presented. They are right now current cases. I did not pull out any cases that came from years or months later. So we see all, all of this all the time. Okay. And um, sometimes in the ear canal, it's too swollen to pass the otoscope to see the tympanum. What do you do in these cases? Uh, it's a technique. Um, we have been managed, we managed to see 98% of the ear canals, no matter how swollen it is. Uh, it is a technique that would get you down. You have to flush the ear uh, very well. And the flushing opens up most of the ear canals, unless it is calcified. No matter how swollen it is, inf uh, soft inflammation, we get down to the tympanic level. Okay. And last question for right now would be, is there a role for laser when dealing with tumors or polyps? Uh, definitely there is. And any tool or equipment you use, my philosophy is more you use, better you get at it. Uh, I did have CO2 laser and I now, I, I still have it, I don't use it, but when I use it, yes, it is very useful. Uh, but knowing what is happening with the ear diseases, um, I have not used the laser as much. Okay, and I need to mention that more than questions, I'm getting comments 
beautiful images, amazing photos, fantastic videos. What is your trick? Why do you why do you have better images than average? Because I use stores equipment. Um, I did not plant that question. Yeah. I'm not, I know, I know. It's, it's, you know, getting good image is definitely a technique. Uh, one has to develop. It's, it's, I see my friends use the same scope and they complain um, that they, they, they can't get the images, but you have to work at it. There's a technique, there's tricks. And that's what I learned from human medicine. There's, we need to, I, I join human, uh, conventions, I go, to, I join human courses, and that's where you pick up all these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, a couple more questions came in. If I can ask you, without histopathology, uh, how are you clinically diagnosing cholesteatoma? I'm sorry, without, without, what was it? I'm sorry, can you repeat it? Without, without histopath, without histopathology, mm -hmm. how are you clinically diagnosing cholesteatoma, for example, as opposed to inspissated exudate? So I can answer that question. Uh, Mood will be able to tell much more because there is a big difference in what, in, in veterinary medicine, what we think, how we diagnose, we should diagnose cholesteatoma. Mood will be able to answer very well because that's the, the philosophy I follow. Sure. So um, in human medicine, we make a clinical diagnosis. So cholesteatoma is defined as a presence of squamous epithelium within the middle ear space. So if it looks like skin, we call it skin. And, you know, it can be difficult because sometimes it's just inflamed tissue and you're not sure. Actually, the first sort of uh, four cholesteatomas that Munir and I uh, operated on, we sent off to a histopathologist who confirmed the diagnosis. So I th think that tells us that if it looks like skin that's in the middle ear, it is a cholesteatoma um, by definition. Okay. Um, one more cholesteatoma question while we're here. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Initial cholesteatoma, I think, I think this is early stage cholesteatoma. Do you perform histology and is it like the classical end stage cholesteatomas? So for cholesteatoma, I do not perform cytology. My diagnosis is based on the, my endoscopic evaluation. That is most of the time, majority of the time, that is how I diagnose cholesterol. There is going to be perforation. When you flush, you see that cheesy stuff coming up. You know perforation and cheesy stuff is cholesterol. Okay, great. Thank you. We'll continue. Okay, transcanal endoscopic surgery. That is a very interesting topic. And uh, let's move to the slide, please. Okay, this is Guinea. She is 10 year old standard poodle. She had a problem, ear problem uh, when she was one year old. She was seen at the dermatology clinic for almost nine years. When I got her records, she, I got the records for last three years and it was 128 pages long. So on the initial presentation, we saw this is what it looked like. Next slide, please. So this is what the ear looked like. Further down, next slide. So you would think that this one is a pseudomonas, uh, Klebsiella, staph, all kind of uh, nasty organisms. We went further down, and this is what the ear was all covered with the uh, discharge. So there's no way you can make any diagnosis from that. After cleaning, we saw there is a cholesteatoma. Uh, right now we are looking at the mesotympanum. So the mesotympanum was all covered with the cholesteatoma. And this is what, how we started cleaning the ear. Um, next, please. Slide, I mean, video, yeah. So we are going through transcanal endoscopic ear surgery. We do not make any incisions. We go all through the ear canal. We put the endoscope through the middle, uh, through the ear, ear canal. We put the tools through the ear canal, and this is what we started removing. Um, this is a cholesteatoma coming out. We removed for hour and a half, we removed cholesteatoma. This is what it looked like after less than two and a half months. Um, 
and, and the owner was just extremely surprised how this discharge can stop. So she didn't want to just stop the treatment. I said, your dog doesn't need any treatment. She, she would not trust me. She still took the medication and wanted to treat the ear. So the next slide. This is Naji. Naji is a three-year-old semoid, uh, came in for little ear problem, six months treatment going on, not, no resolution. So we ended up seeing Naji. Uh, we put the scope in there. It did not look like anything too, too, too interesting. You know, that looked like just a simple ear canal, just little uh, swax in there. Deep down, this is what we found. And there was a grass seed sitting there. And without the scope, you are not going to see that grass seed um, sticking out. Underneath, there was a polysteotoma. So after flushing, we got, the, got down to the... Uh, distal part of horizontal canal and removed the grass seed that was causing all the problem. We went down trans canal and here we are removing the cholesteotoma pearl. And so after removing this, there was a big um, defect in the tympanic membrane, there's a big perforation. And we can see the middle ear floor very clearly. We can identify all the different uh, anatomy there. We went through the, through the perforation and evaluated and made sure that there was no grass seed in there. So next slide, please. So this is a video. Uh, we go in the middle ear and get 360 degree uh, view of it and make sure there is a irritation from grass seed sitting in the middle ear floor. Uh, there is a bulla on the right side. You just check every area that you can and then make sure everything is fine. Now, after the treatment, 50 days later, this is the tympanic membrane. Tympanic membrane healed very well. And the tympanic membrane does very well if the pathology is removed. If you have problem uh, healing the tympanic membrane, there is the disease is still present. Next, please. Okay, uh, Ralphie. Ralphie is 10 and a half year old, Shih Tzu, uh, came in, he had bilateral cholesteotoma diagnosed at the specialty clinic. Uh, the right, right ear was, uh, had a uh, tika done uh, with the bolosteotomy and he had a lot of problems uh, and the owner was very concerned. The, the referral clinic or the specialty clinic had plan to do the other side, the left side, uh, Tika. But when they saw the, the result, they were very afraid to do surgery on the left side. What you are seeing here is the promontory is completely removed. Uh, I don't know whether it was a disease that removed or not, but this is where the CT scan is so important that you need to look at it. Next slide. Now, 3D reconstruction, we noticed that tagment tympani is also has a perforation. Tagment tympani is the bone between the brain and the inner ear. Uh, that was removed, so we could see the CSF leak in, 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 the, in the right ear. So the owner was very concerned that she wanted to do the surgery on the left side. She brought the dog and she kept asking me, what is gonna be the recovery on, on, the, on the left side? So we evaluated the ear. This is what the preliminary presentation looks like. And after cleaning the ear, you can see the cholesteotoma formation uh, in pars placida, that brown stuff that is building up. Uh, we did the surgery we, and, and, and she just kept asking me over and over, what is the recovery? How, how, what kind of pain medication are you gonna give him? And I asked her finally, I said, why are you asking this question? And she said, the surgery on the right side was during the recovery. It was so horrible that if dog has to go through that, she does not want to perform the surgery. And I said, no, no, this is going to be just fine. So we performed the transcanal endoscopic uh, cholesteotoma surgery. This is what uh, that looks like. There's a cholesteotoma sitting in the middle here. And after the surgery, I called her next day and I asked her, how is Ralphie doing? And she said, I can't believe he had a surgery done yesterday. Dog is running around, no head tilt, no pain, no, no discomfort. And after three months, I saw Ralphie again, and this is what his um, ear looks like. 
and and Ona was just surprised from the difference between the the, the ventricular approach versus transcanal endoscopic gear surgery approach. Thanks, Manu. So um, I think uh, uh, Manu there has really shown um, some pioneering work, really showing that with the advances we've got with the endoscope, you know, accessing the middle ear space for this cholesteatoma through an already perforated tympanic membrane really offers, you know, minimal access surgery and great uh, opportunity for, for um, uh, quicker recovery and less, uh, less harm uh, in terms of pain for the dogs. However, sometimes it is difficult to perform that surgery. And um, so Munir and I have been working uh, on the traditional approach, which is the ventral bullet osteotomy. But we've recognized that in the dog, ventral bullet osteotomy can be difficult. Um, so it looks, you know, uh, easy to access. You've got this, you know, this lump on the uh, on the skull base that you should be able to access. In a cat, it's relatively easy. It's palpable. In the dog, not so often. Various breeds, it may actually be flatter to get this against the skull, so actually very difficult to to feel. And it can also be surrounded by bulky neck musculature. Uh, you normally need to go, well, the standard approach is through the neck, dissecting between various muscles um, uh, until you find this piece of bone down, down a deep, dark hole. And it can be difficult. It can be difficult, first of all, to identify it, um, not to damage any surrounding structures, and then to operate within it in a deep, dark hole. And here we've used um, some, some modifications to the technique with contemporary surgical approaches. So... The first thing we did was actually explore image guidance um, uh, as a technique to just give you greater security that you are actually on the bulla. So we've scanned uh, some of the dogs that we're operating on for cholesterol. We scanned them in the surgical position, um, which is uh, as shown here. And then those images can be put into an image guidance system and, and Storz kindly lent us um, their image guidance system, which is an optical system. And so by using sort of various markers uh, attached to um, relatively immobile areas around the dog head, it then allows you obviously to uh, calibrate the CT image to the, um, to the actual uh, patient in front of you. And then you can use a probe, which is uh, detected by cameras around to give you three dimensional space in terms of depth of the dissection that you're doing and rostral and caudal location. And therefore you can see hopefully with this image on the right, this probe is telling us we're right over the diseased bulla. And certainly in the small number of cases we've done, it's been incredibly helpful to just give you the confidence to say, yes, you're down this deep dark hole and um, you are where you should be. You can enter here and you won't enter into the brain or some other structure that you might be work uh, scared of. We've also found we can do a smaller approach because we don't need to have such a great exposure necessarily as we're finding this. And then once we're inside the bulla, uh, we normally open the bulla uh, using a, a chisel. Uh, and then once we need to enter, again, you've got this deep dark hole, but you don't need to worry about that because of course you've got an endoscope and the endoscope allows you to visualize inside. So this is endoscopically assisted dissection through the ventral bulla approach. And I think uh, obviously you can see the disease and we can uh, be confident that we're trying to remove uh, almost all of the disease or hopefully all of the disease. And we can use angled endoscopes as well within the bullet to look around corners to get to everything that we need. Um, and I can't tell you that it's easy to identify the normal structures, but it's certainly uh, much easier to be assured that you're not dissecting out uh, inappropriate structures, such as, for example, the promontory such as um, uh, the facial nerve, because you can be gentle in your approach and, and gently peel this cholesterol off. And here you can see that the, the disease is all removed. And we're also trying some approaches. It's still very early days. We haven't got large experience. This is actually the tympanic membrane is just up there on the left. And I've taken a graft of tissue there to try and repair the tympanic membrane, uh, a technique again we use in humors to try to reconstruct the ear. Um, and so that may be something that we can use in the future. So again, just really utilizing the endoscope to give us much, much better visualization down this deep dark hole and really, I think, improve the safety as well as the efficacy of, of ventral bulla osteotomy for, for, for cholesteatoma. So uh, thank you, we'll, we'll stop there and, and happy to take any more questions uh, you may have.
Yes. Uh, once cholesteatoma is removed, what is the outcome? Do cases usually resolve themselves or are further interventions required? In my experience, it is, it is very, very a lot. I have removed cholesteatoma and I don't see the patients for a number of years and it is gone. I have removed cholesteatoma thinking everything is removed with endoscope, we visualize every single area and cholesterol is back within a few months, a year. Uh, you might have to do maintenance once in a while, you might have to go in and flush out the ear. Um, it, it varies, there's no set answer to this question. Okay. This question simply says, do you use suction at times, and I think that means during surgery. A lot, because there is quite a bit of bleeding, there's a lot of discharge, and yes, you do need to use suction. But the, the thing, the most important part in using suction is the tip that you are using. Uh, in veterinary medicine, we are kind of uh, too aggressive, in my opinion. In some time, in some cases, it's not very uh, advantageous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have to be careful about the size of the suction tip. Here's an interesting one. Are you aware of any visual anatomical variations in the ear canal of big cats? Big cats variations, no. I'm sure there is because the number of variations I see in dogs and cats, I'm sure it happens, but you need enough numbers to, to identify them. Okay, are there certain breeds that are predispos predisposed to cholesteatomas? If I have, I, I don't, yeah, I probably was a brachycephalic, but particularly phanges, because their isthmus is so narrow and it traps all the debris and uh, that pushes into the uh, middle ear. That is my, in my opinion, I think that is the number one breed. Um, it's interesting because as human dis disorders as well, we recognize children who have some craniofacial malformation will also be at much higher risk of middle ear disease, including cholesteatoma. So I think there's similarities there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding the suction, this person says, I've been using a small rubber feeding tube as a suction tip. Is that what you use? Or if not, what do you use? Well, small rubber tip, a small feeding tip, uh, I don't use that because it's a little too big. Uh, the size that I use when I'm in the middle ear uh, is 18 gauge um, tip, suction tip. And that is, I, I don't know how small the person, what a small feeding tube the person is using. The other problem I would have with the feeding tube is it's too flimsy. You need to guide it at a very specific location. And that flimsy tube is very difficult to point at the. When you are in the middle ear, the, the distance you are dealing with is a micro uh, millimeter distances. So it's not that easy to maneuver and handle things. What is the percentage of otitis associated with vestibular syndrome? And especially, do you have any pointers you can give in regard to identifying it? It says rather, rather associating with CVS. I think, uh, I think that's a translation error, but what is, what is the percentage of otitis associated with vestibular syndrome? Uh, again, I see a lot more franchise with uh, otitis related to the vestibular disease. Um, once I go in the middle ear and clean up, there is a very high success rate. Uh, they do get their um, balance back. They do get their head quite a bit back, not sometimes in the person, but much more functional than they have. Uh, dogs, they start chasing balls and, and they, they play just like they used to. So yes. Um, and one final question, I think, what topical and systemic therapies do you use during and after middle ear cleaning or surgery? I don't think there's any one thing I use. I more likely use more water-based than oil-based. Uh, I make my own concoctions, uh, steroids and antibiotic combination. 
uh, Betro, uh, DexSP, DexSP, other antibiotics, depending on if you want to do the culture. Uh, I very rarely do culture, um, but I, I, I would, I would generally, I would stay with the water-based medication. Okay, gentlemen, thank you both very much for a really thought-provoking presentation. Um, thank you, Mood, for thank doing you. in the middle of the night in the UK. Once thank again, you, like, yeah, thanks. Once again, I'd like to thank all of you in the audience for joining us. In two weeks' time, we will be hearing from a group called SAMIT. This is the study group of small animal minimally invasive treatments out of Japan, comprised of five experienced laparoscopic surgeons, one of whom is an MD. The SAMIT group will present lessons from a human surgeon performing laparoscopic cholecystectomy. That session will take place on February 24th at 8 p.m. New York time, which is also February 25th at 10 a.m. Tokyo time. We certainly hope to see you then, and in the meantime, wishing you all the best of health. I'm Dr. Eric Monet, and I've been teaching uh, soft tissue surgeries at Colorado State University for almost 30 years now. And at the end of my residency, I got exposed to minimally invasive surgeries and laparoscopic surgery. And since that day, it's been a game changer for me because since that day, I've been trying to apply this technique to a lot of the different procedures we can do in small animals. So I hope you get the same experience after that course. And a lot of people now uh, are seeking for veterinarians that can do minimally invasive surgeries in their dog uh, for ovariectomies, for gastropexies, or also for some diagnostic procedures. And the main advantage you're going to see for you as a general practitioner is the quality of the work you can do and the amount of exposure you can get during those procedures. So um, you'll have this experience during taking those courses. For the course, we have um, three instructors, Dr. Tweed, that is an internist, Dr. Craig Webb, that is also an internist, and myself uh, being a surgeon. So all three of us will be there um, teaching during those three modules and the introductory modules will give you all the basic principles to be able to perform a safe laparoscopic procedures in your practice. And you'll be able to work during this course in simulators and canine cadavers. And then we'll follow with other modules on ovariectomies and the modules on uh, laparoscopic assisted gastropexy. And those two last modules will be performed on live dogs from a rescue operation. So we'll have to follow aseptic techniques because those dogs have to go back to their rescue to be adopted. So you'll have one-on-one -on -one teaching uh, with me and another uh, surgeon scrubbing in with you. So at the end of these um, three courses, you'll have a great experience and you'll be able to perform a safe laparoscopic uh, procedures in your practice.